All right, here we are, Daniel, Revelation, lesson number 11. Okay, I've repeated often that uh, in studying the book of Revelation, uh, we mustn't lose sight of the fundamental story because there's so many images, there's so much symbolism, so much action, so much weird looking stuff that, that, that you know, John writes about in this eschatological type of language, you know, uh, uh, that it's easy to forget the story. And the story is very simple. The story is the rise of the church and then the attempt by Satan in the person of the Roman Empire to destroy the church. And then of course the survival of the church despite this attack and the eventual judgment and destruction of Rome and Satan and all of his cohorts and then the final exaltation of the church in heaven with God. That's the story of Revelation. So the story is not very complicated, but the symbolism sometimes complicates it. And of course, John gives a lot of detail in his prophecy. Normally prophecy doesn't have as much detail in it as John gives. You know, usually prophecy looks forward to a time, mentions an event of sorts. You know. Uh, Jeremiah talks about the, uh, the Israelites you know, that, that will be carried away. Well, that's one event. You know, but he doesn't talk about the details of the day, how many people are going to be there, which king is going to do it, all that kind of stuff. Whereas John provides a lot of the historical and political detail of what went on in his prophecies. And so therefore, that's why the images and the symbols, that's why there's so many of them, because he talks about and he gives a lot of details. So the symbols get a little confusing, but this is the basic story that they tell. And so, so far in the story that we have done, this is what has taken place so far. First of all, Christ and His church have been introduced you know, in the book of Revelation. Christ and His church has been introduced. Both God's power, remember the parade of power there, both God's power and Satan's power uh, have been described. You know, the seven trumpets reveal God's warning and God's power. Then on the other hand, you have Satan and the allies that he's recruited uh, have been described. You know, the dragon and the beast and the false prophet, all of these characters have been uh, described in the story. And then uh, John talks about the attacks that Satan has made on the church, on the throne in heaven, on the individuals and so on and so forth. And then, of course, God's response to this attack has also been described, the bowls of wrath, you know, that God, that's judgment being poured down uh, on the earth. So last week we described the bowls of wrath that represent God's judgment, you know, the extent and the power of God's judgment on Satan and on his followers. Now the sixth bowl spoke of military invasion and it is here that John says that Satan will marshal his forces to fight uh, against being defeated. And this great battle is referred to as Harmageddon. Uh, and I explained to you last time that Harmageddon was a real place, but really it was representative. It was an image that meant you know, the mother of all battles, you know, the Waterloo, the Alamo, well, same, same idea, Armageddon, was the image, again, a real place in Jewish history and geography, but it was symbolic of great battles and great victories and great losses in Jewish history. So as we go into this and the final lesson next week, we're going to see John finish the book with visions of Satan's judgment and punishment, and then the final vision of the exaltation of the church uh, to the um, heavenly realm. So we're at uh, chapter 17, as usual, you can read out of your Bibles, I'll throw these up, I'll throw the passages up on the screen as we go along. So in chapter 17, there's a pause. He does this, right? You've got the action, then all of a sudden there's a pause. So in se chapter 17, there's a pause as we receive more information about Rome and the reason for her judgment and punishment, which was announced in the seventh bowl. You know, the, the seventh bowl comes out in chapter 16, talks about the judgment on Rome. Well then in chapter 17, there's a pause and a kind of a, a parenthetical statement made as to why this judgment is going to be 
um, visited upon Rome. So we begin in verse one and two. Uh, the great harlot is uh, uh, the city of Rome. Let me give you some of the uh, images here. The adultery that uh, will be talked about is the idolatry that is practiced throughout the empire and encouraged by the empire. You know, uh, emperor worship, that's idolatry. And the word Babylon, of course, we know refers to the ancient kingdom of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, so on and so forth. But in this context, uh, Babylon refers to an evil world power. And at the time, Rome was the evil world power. That was in the, in the spirit of the ancient Babylon, another ancient evil world power that existed 100 years before. So we start in 17.1. He says, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me saying, come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who is on many waters. And he says, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. So he says, she sits on many waters, refers to the nations. Um, an empire over many nations. Uh, adultery, or the, here when he talks about the immorality, uh, that is the sin of idolatry. And adultery with kings is Rome's sin of leading other nations into idolatry and worldliness. In other words, Rome is a leader in encouraging others to sin, other nations to sin and to join in sinfulness and idolatry. So he keeps going, verse three, and he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and 10 horns. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. And so there's the description of the harlot, the woman, which is the city of Rome itself. Uh, she sits on the beast, which means that she derives her power from the beast, which is the Roman Empire, described back in chapter 13. Uh, she's dressed as a queen. Uh, notice there's no mention here of beauty. Uh, not beautiful, but the picture of, is one of excess luxury and, 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 and uh, a haughty splendor. So it's a splendor, splendorous look, but nothing actually beautiful about it. Uh, the cup is, um, is her sins of immorality and blasphemy and the blood of the, uh, the bless, uh, blood of the saints. Uh, and her name is Babylon the Great. Now, if you were reading this, if you're a Jew in the first century, the Jews understood that Babylon stood for worldly greatness wrapped in immorality, idolatry, and pride. It was the standard for earthly wicked. If you want the standard, you know, the gold standard for evil, <laughs> well, in Jewish history, that was Babylon, okay? And so transferred to the modern time when they were existing, any world power or any standard for evil called Babylon you know, was Rome. I mean, there was no other country, no other nation, no other city that could aspire to that role except Rome. So the only thing, the only power that would represent this in their time was the city of Rome, not the city of Ephesus or the city of Jerusalem or any other great city. Only Rome could represent the standard for world evil at the time. So in the idea of future prophecy, uh, mode, you know, in the present context of the first century, the harlot you know, was Rome. Now if you take this as a future ongoing prophecy, then this woman represents not only Rome, but in ongoing prophecy, the cycle that she represents is any power center with these attributes, 
Rome wasn't the last, quote, world power that tried to overtake the world with evil. I mean, we could, even in our own lifetime, we can name several world powers that tried to do the exact same thing. And, and, and uh, you know, we're responsible for a lot more deaths than Rome was. I mean, just thinking of what the Third Reich did in the Second World War, the millions and millions of people that they were responsible for murdering and torturing, and in such a short, I mean, Rome, four or five hundred years, the Third Reich, how many years? 20 years maybe, max, from the beginning you know, to the end of the war and everything? I think Hitler, 12 years. So the amount of people that were killed in the Second World War because of the Third Reich's uh, lust for power and their evil uh, intentions, uh, certainly you know, the cycle of evil. You know, who, who was the harlot? Who was Babylon you know, in the 20th century? Well, we could easily point to Hitler and his regime as that uh, ongoing you know, cycle of evil power uh, desiring world dominance uh, in our lifetime. And so in verse uh, seven to um, uh, verse seven to 17, he continues, we read verse seven, it says, and the angel said to me, why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and uh, the 10 horns. And so it's very interesting, uh, or excuse me, very confusing, unless you understand that the angel is describing the relationship between the beast, that's the creature, the Roman empire, upon which the harlot sits. Well, the harlot is Rome and it sits uh, upon the beast, which is the empire, and its relationship with all of its allies. So the angel also gives a more detailed description of the beast itself. And so we read in verse eight, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. And so he describes the beast as one who was, is not, and is about to come out of the abyss and destroy. So what he's describing, he's describing the beast in relationship to their present persecution. Watch how this works. So he talks about the beast that was. Well, the beast that was, the persecution began under Nero in 68 AD, but it stopped after his death. So Nero was, that's the beast that was. Then it was quiet under Vespasian and Titus. And so Nero and his persecution is not. So the persecution was with Nero, and then it was not. After Nero died, the next two emperors didn't start a period of persecution. Then under Domitian, who many thought was Nero reincarnated, the persecution began again. So Nero about to come from the abyss to persecute and destroy. In other words, he was dead, he's coming back through Domitian to continue the persecution. So when John is describing the beast, the empire, he says, well, here's the empire and how it works. It was, the beast was, in other words, Nero was persecuting you, and then it was not, in other words, the persecution stopped for a time and is about to come out of the abyss to do it again. Well, you know, Nero's coming back from the dead, so to speak, in the person of Domitian to continue the persecution of the church. So he also says he is not written in the book of life, uh, the book of life, excuse me. He is Satan's tool, the beast is Satan's tool. And so John personifies the empire, the, empire, the beast, into one single person, and that is Nero. Remember we told you about 666? About the value of each number you know, connected to the alphabet, it was a Jewish riddle, and when you worked that riddle out, it gave you the name of Nero. So he's talking about who is the beast? Well, the beast, of course, is the entire Roman Empire that gives the city of Rome its power, all right? And so he, what he does is he takes all of this and he compresses it down to one single name, one single person who personifies all of this evil, and that's Nero. Nero was, then he wasn't for a while, and now he's kind of come back in the person of Domitian 
to continue his evil persecution of the church. So let's keep reading verse 9 to 11. He says, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and they are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes he must remain a little while. The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. Okay, everybody got that? <laughs> Remember I told you in the Bible, sometimes a writer will describe a thing or a person one way, and then turn around and describe exactly the same thing, but he'll do it in another way. And so if you're trying to kind of get two things, you lose. You have to remember, they're always describing the same thing. He's always describing Rome. He's always describing different facets of Rome. So he describes in another way who this beast is by describing the relationship that the beasts Satan has used in the past with God's people. In the past, Satan has used many beasts to persecute God's people. He says that the mountains are mountains or kings. The Roman Empire is the latest manifestation of the beast who has existed throughout history. Now watch. The kings represent kingdoms who have acted as the beast in the past, opposing God and persecuting God's people. Watch. Remember we studied Daniel, right? Watch. Okay, the mountains are the kings. The kings are persecuting kingdoms. So he says, five are fallen. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece. Five kingdoms that persecuted God's people. They were persecuting and they're gone. Then he says, one is. Oh, that's the present kingdom. Who's that? That's Rome, okay? Then he says, all others in the future in the future, the ones who are to come. Well, who are the ones who are to come? Well, we talked about one in our lifetime, you know, the Third Reich. You know. In other words, this cycle of evil kingdoms, evil ideas, evil leaders who will persecute the church and make no doubt about, you know, have no doubts about this. If you look at the history of the Third Reich and what their goal was, their goal was to destroy the church. They wanted to destroy the church because the church, Christianity, was standing up to it and saying, this is wrong, this is evil, and so on and so forth. So they had no compunction about killing priests or ministers or theologians, anyone who would stand up and say, this is morally wrong. Never mind if you were military, if you were just saying, it's morally wrong what you were doing, boy, they got rid of you in a hurry. Destroy churches and so on and so forth, okay? So, he says, five are fallen, we've mentioned those. One is, that's Rome, that's the one they're going through at the moment. There'll be others in the future to come, and all of this will be persecuting power. In other words, the eighth one is the persecution used by all of these world powers. It was, then it wasn't, and then eventually it will be destroyed because the one who is wielding it will be destroyed. And who is the one wielding this persecuting power? Well, it's Satan. Satan uses persecuting power through the agency of all these kingdoms to do what? To try to destroy the church. And even before the church was established on Pentecost, before that, the Jewish people. The Jewish people represented the seed, they carried the seed that would eventually become the church. Well, how many of these powers tried to destroy Israel? Even within themselves, there was this idea of evil. They even had their own evil kings that tried to kind of self-destruct and led the people of Israel into idolatry. So he's talking about a phenomenon that has existed from the very beginning that continues, the cycle continues, Satan using this persecuting power against God's people and ultimately, this will stop, this will be destroyed, but only when Satan himself is destroyed. So let's read verse 12. Uh, we, we got that, is that good? We're, we're locked in? All right, so knowing this, then he says, the 10 horns which you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose and they give their power and authority to the beast. 
These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are Him are the, excuse me, and those who are with Him are the called and uh, chosen faithful. And He said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw, and the beast, these will hate the harlot, and will make her desolate and naked, and will eat her flesh, and will burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to execute His purpose by having a common purpose, and by giving their kingdom to the beast, until the words of God will be fulfilled. The woman whom you saw is the great city, which reigns over the kings of the earth. So this is a narrative. He's saying, now watch what's going to happen here to the harlot. Watch what's going to happen to Babylon, Rome. Watch what's going to happen. The ten horns of the beast, which are ten kings, refers to the alliances that have been made with barbarian kingdoms after conquering them. And we know historically that's what Rome did. For a time, it consolidated its empire you know, when it controlled everything. You know, Top-down management from the emperor down. But with time, the kingdom grew so big, so far flung, that it was easier to make alliances with these outer kingdoms here you know, to maintain the empire. And what John is saying, he's predicting, he's prophesying that in the end, these kings that, he's made that, that, that Rome has made alliances with will turn on her. And that's exactly what happened in history. These barbarian kingdoms that had a loose alliance with Rome eventually turned against her and attacked and attacked her, okay? So historically, Rome relied on these nations but forbade their rulers to enjoy Roman orgies or celebrations because they were not citizens. Believe it or not, this was part of the resentment that these you know, barbarian kings, you know, yeah, we got to do the heavy lifting, we got to do the military stuff, but we can't enjoy you know, the, uh, what can I say, the debauchery that you guys are, are enjoying because we're not Roman citizens. They weren't invited to the party. It's like being in junior high, you know what I'm saying? Anyway. So John describes the harlot, Rome, and the beast that gives her power, the empire, he also explains that this beast has existed in many forms before and used exactly the same tactic, persecution, and will do so again against God's people. His encouragement, however, is that this present beast and its harlot will be destroyed and along with that destruction, the persecution against the believers will eventually stop. All right, so now we go to chapter 18. Chapter 18, the fall of the harlot. We've had the announcement that the city, the harlot, will fall. Now we see how, uh, not how, but how great this fall really will be. Now I'm not, we don't have time to read all the passages. Like I say, we read some and then we move, we you know, kind of skip over some others. Let me just uh, kind of summarize what happens in chapter 18, verses uh, one to eight. In, in chapter 18, there is an announcement of the destruction. Hear ye, hear ye. There's going to be a destruction happening, all right? And so there's a dirge or a lament. You know, the book of Lamentations. You know, Jeremiah, in his book of prophecy, he talks about what's going to happen and so on and so forth. And then in the book of uh, happened to the Jews, that they will be destroyed, the city will be destroyed, they'll be carried away because they refuse to repent and so on and so forth. That's in the book of Jeremiah. But in the book of Lamentations, there's a lament. In other words, he is lamenting, he is sorrowful over what has happened to the Jewish people. And, and the book of Lamentations is a sorrowful, it's a dirge, it's a type of literature that, that mourns the loss of the Jewish people and the loss of the city and the loss of God's favor and so on and so forth, okay? So in chapter 18, there's also a dirge. There's also a lamentation, except the lamentation is not by God's people, it's by the people of the world who lament or who will lament the fall of the Roman Empire for various reasons. So there are two voices here that will announce the destruction of the harlots. Number one, the first voice declares the reason for her fall 
and that will be spiritual fornication. She has seduced others into idolatry and wickedness. That's the first sin, that's the first judgment against her, announced by the first voice. Then another voice comes up and calls God's people not to be entangled in her sins and names another sin, and that is the one of pride. The age-old sin of pride versus God, beginning with Satan himself and then every other ruler that God has destroyed because of their pride, because they, for, they, they refuse to submit to God's authority. And so if you go on uh, chapter uh, 18, verses nine to 19, after the dirge, then there will be an effect on the wicked, excuse me, the dirge comes next. First, the judgment, the two voices, why you're being destroyed. Next, verses nine to 19, is the dirge, the lament, the mourning. As I said, not by God's people. The mourning will be by the people, uh, the, the nations that were entangled with Rome. And so, let me just uh, look at this. And so you have the two voices declare the sins, right? The spiritual adultery and the persecution. And so they begin to mourn, and when they mourn, they're, they're, they're saying uh, they're going to mourn for two reasons. First of all, if the great city can fall, it means that the allies don't stand a chance either. If Rome falls, imagine these other kingdoms that have alliances with her, they're going to fall too. And then secondly, a very modern idea here, and that is an economic one, the mourning is for economic reasons. Rome, as the center of world trade, will cause an economic disaster when she falls. The business people, the traders, the bankers, all of them will mourn because of the economic depression that will take place because of the fall of Rome. And I mean, it's not too hard to understand. I mean, you know, in our political system here in the last little while, right, haven't there been warnings if the United States defaults on their debts, it'll cause a chain reaction of, of, uh, of uh, economic disasters around the world, you know, our credit rating will go down. So, you know, if, if the United States economy falls, well, all the other economies are going to fall too. Why? Because it's the number one economy. We're the number one consumers in the world. If we don't consume anymore, well then the other people, you know, where, China, where is China going to sell their goods? You know, this, is, this is the main market right here. So that was what was happening in Rome. Rome was the main consumer. And so when Rome fell economically, everybody else fell as well. And so uh, in his prophecy of what's going to happen in the future, John says, and when the harlot falls, there will be great mourning, not by Christians, but by the people in the world who will mourn her fall because there won't be all the goodies that used to be. So we look at verse 20, I'll just pick one. It says, rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. So John describes the opposite reaction of those who have been persecuted by Rome. So he shows Rome, the reason why it's being judged, its destruction, and what will happen, people will mourn the loss, and so on and so forth, and then he switches the scene and he says, okay, now let's look at the Christians. How are they going to feel when Rome falls? Well, the image here is one of rejoicing, one of happiness. In verse 21 to 23, Let's keep reading that. It says, then a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, so will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. And the sound of harpists and musicians and flute players and trumpeters will not be heard in you any longer, and no craftsman or any craft will be found in you any longer. And the sound of a mill will not be heard in you any longer, and the light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will not be heard in you any longer. And so the nature of the fall will be great and quick. No music, no rejoicing, no crafts, no industry or commerce. The mill will stop. In other words, food shortages. No light, meaning not light like the light bulbs or the candles, but the, no light, no knowledge. There'll be no knowledge. In other words, all of this is going to happen and you're not going to learn anything. 
You're not going to learn anything from what's going to happen to you. No knowledge. The lights are going to go out and that's it. No marriage. In other words, no love, no, no joyful family things. So in relation to its rise and stay of power, which was about four to five hundred years, the destruction and the loss of power is going to be great and will happen in a relatively short amount of time. And so we read another couple of verses here. Um, the reasons for the fall. Well, we said idolatry and persecution. That's why God is judging them. But if we read in verse 23 and 24, it says, For your merchants were the great men of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of the prophets, of saints, and of all who have been slain on the earth. There's the, there's the judgment. A, you, know, you induced others to sin. B, you persecuted Christians. You persecuted uh, the church. So you know, if you compare, uh, Paul the Apostle was also guilty of rejecting Christ and persecuting the church, but he, were, he repented and he was forgiven. Rome, on the other hand, when it was judged, when it was beginning to fall, it simply became more stubborn and was eventually completely destroyed. All right. So now we go to we're in chapter nine. We go to chapter nineteen, and in chapter nineteen you have the wedding feast and the fall of the two beasts. The power of God and His judgment on the beast and the harlot have been pronounced. This is what's going to happen to you. This is why this is going to happen to you. Okay. So time-wise, you have to understand now. Time-wise, it's understood that when God pronounces something, whether it be a blessing or a curse or a judgment. The thing itself, even if it has not happened, is considered as done from a biblical perspective. You understand what I'm saying? So a lot of times the writers will write like in the present tense. Rome is destroyed, Rome is judged, Rome is destroyed, Rome is finished. And yet you look around and you say, well, wait a minute, the city's still here, there's still traffic, people are selling, they got armies, you know, things are going on. That's because uh, we're not interpreting correctly the way God communicates. If He says Rome is finished, that it might take 200 years, but you can be absolutely sure that Rome is finished because when He pronounces it, it's as good as done. It's just you know, the mop-up operation. You know what I'm saying? Like you win a war and then there's a mop-up operation. Well, it's just a mopping up after. But conversely, when He says this good thing's going to happen, you're going to be in heaven, you're going to live eternally, when he, he pronounces the blessing, even though you may have another 20, 30 years, 50 years of living to go on, your eternal life, I mean, it's as good as done. Because he said, this is what's going to happen to you. Even if you keep going and living and having kids and building a house and doing whatever, whatever, the promise he made is complete. It's that sure. So whether it be a curse or a promise, the minute he speaks it, it's in stone. Okay? And so if God says it, even if it's only in 20 years, it's as if it has already happened. For this reason, once the judgment on the enemy has been spoken, the next scene is one of rejoicing. So in verse 1 to 10 in Romans 19, uh, Romans, <laughs> Revelation 19, uh, they begin to rejoice over the judgment of the harlot. You begin to see them rejoicing and so on and so forth. They do so because God has heard and responded to their prayers concerning the martyred saints, and it'll be an eternal judgment. It won't be just, well, we'll just give them a slap on the wrist. It'll be, they're judged, they're destroyed, they're never coming back. And so there's great rejoicing. Um, everyone in heaven is rejoicing. John is describing that scene. The angels, the four living creatures, and all of the saints. And the rejoicing is compared to a Jewish wedding feast. The rejoicing has three parts that John describes. Part one, the betrothal. And a Jewish wedding, there was the betrothal. And the betrothal was when the husband paid the dowry. When the husband paid, the future husband, when the husband paid the dowry, they were betrothed. They were as good as married. Because once he paid the dowry, 
If he wanted to break that betrothal, he had to get a certificate of divorce. That's, that's, you know, people say, well, when were they officially married? When the betrothal was paid for, that's when they were married. The next part was the interval. The partners would prepare, but would not live together. All Christians are in this, I mean, if we're looking at this from a, um, um, a, a spiritual perspective of us being with Christ in heaven, you know, he's, the, he's the groom, we're the bridegroom, the church. That's the, the, Jesus has paid the betrothal price. And what was that? His life on the cross. That was the cost. That was the dowry, if you wish, that needed to be paid to purchase the bride. His death on the cross and His resurrection. Then there's the interval in a Jewish wedding, the partners would get ready, the home, or the, the wedding fee, all that stuff would be prepared. Usually took about a year. Well, we're in that interval period. We're, you know, we're living out our lives. We're in the Christian era. We're in that thousand years between the cross and the, and the second coming. We're in that interval now, getting ready. Isn't that the message of the gospels all the time? Jesus is always saying, no one knows when you know, the end is coming. No one knows. Just be ready. All right? And then the third part of a Jewish wedding was the feast, the celebration. Right? That's not when they got married. They were already married. They got ready. The celebration is when the groom would go through the village streets, a parade of his family, playing harps and lutes and tambourines, and they'd be a whole procession and they'd go get the bride at her house, her father's house, and they'd take her and they'd go to the place where there was the wedding feast, and the wedding feast would go on sometime for days, you know? and then the couple would then go to their home that had been prepared. Today we do it in reverse, kind of, you know, the, the, the wedding feast is when they officially get married, but that's not the way it was with the Jews. So if you're comparing this to the church in Christ, the celebration, is when Christ returns for us. And we will always be in a perpetual state of celebration. The groom will finally come for his bride. So they're rejoicing because the time of celebration is at hand. The bride and the groom will be united. So John falls before the angel, but the angel directs his worship to the true object of all worship, which is Jesus Christ. So let's take a look here. We've got five minutes left, let's read. He says, and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God and the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean were following him on, um, on white horses uh, from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. Uh, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried out with a loud voice saying to all the birds which fly in mid heaven, come, assemble for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves and small and great. So once again, Jesus is revealed in His glorious state as the one who will win the victory over the enemy and as the one who will execute victory. So here's the one, along with his army, who will face Satan and his allies at Armageddon, at Armageddon. We've seen the bad guys, you know, the beast and all, the harlot and the, so on. Now we see the good guys, you know, Jesus, the white horse and his army. Now, what's interesting is there's no description of a battle. <laughs> In Revelation, it talks about the battle, but there's no description of the battle. And there's a, there's a reason for that. The simple appearance of Christ announces victory. All he has to do is show up. By showing up, there's vic there is no hand-to-hand -hand combat. Maybe we win, maybe we lose. No, 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 no. The evil one shows up with his people and the moment that the Christ shows up with his people, the battle is over. There is no battle. There is no engagement, let's put it 
Let's put it that way. You know, in the Gospels, you know, when Jesus faced uh, an impure spirit, right? What would he do? He'd say, come out of him, right? Was there any grappling? Did he grab the guy and get him in a headlock? You know, come on, get out. I told you once, I'm going to tell you, no, 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 don't you fight back. There was none of that. It was just a command. Yeah. Get out of him. Oh, please don't go. Yeah, we're legion. Let, please let us stay. Get out. You know. Can we go into the pigs? OK. So uh, we, we already know that Jesus doesn't engage okay, with Satan and the evil spirits. He, he merely commands them to do and they obey. So in the book of Revelation, he simply shows up and it says you know, the sword you know, coming out of his mouth. That's the word of God. The minute the word of God is presented before the Satan and all of his armies, the battle is over. They've lost. So uh, John mixes all of the climactic events, he puts them all together. The image of the celebration or the victory gathering with Christ and his followers is flashed against the scene of battle where Satan and his forces are defeated by Christ and the saints. It's a little bit like a movie scene that shows a victory celebration, but there are flashbacks to the, you know, to the battles. That's what John is doing here. He, the main scene is the victory and then there are flashbacks to Satan showing up and Jesus showing up and the battle is over and so on and so forth. So in verses 19 to 21, it says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So John describes the defeat of the enemy one at a time. The harlot Rome, the city is destroyed. The beast which is the empire, the beast from the sea destroyed the false prophet you know, false religion, so on and so forth, all destroyed. The lake of fire and brimstone is hell, the place of eternal punishment. The followers were killed with the sword, which is the, the entire empire, killed with the sword. All right, so now that the allies are gone, only one is left to deal with, and that's Satan himself. Remember I talked about the movie, the hero fights his way through the, the opposing army to get to the the, the main bad guy, you know, the main villain, and at the end it'll be the main villain guy against the main hero guy. Well, this is the same, you know, the same trajectory of John's story. You know, we've gotten rid of all the secondary characters and now it's just mano a mano, you know, the last two. You know, Jesus will finally destroy Satan and we'll get to that. That'll be our last class next week. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>